Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Madhura Swaminathan, and we'll be discussing what is the impact of the lockdown, and particularly on the sections which were already already at the margins, and whether the recent financial package, which is being touted as this great bonanza for the people, does it really help the sections which are most affected by the lockdown? Madhura, good to have you with us, and but of course, not on a very happy occasion. You have written about this lockdown and its impact and the kind of measures that you think should be taken. Now, coming to the first question that I have, what is the impact particularly on the sections which already have a bad record in terms of malnutrition, hunger and so on? And we know that India has one of the highest stunting in the world amongst young children. So what do you think is the impact of this lockdown that has been there on them? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rabin. I think it's very important to start with uh, the fact that even before COVID, India has a record. We hold the world record for undernourished people. So in terms of children, in terms of adults, in terms of women, particularly pregnant women, various criteria which we take, whether it's uh, anthropometric criteria like weight for age or body mass index or even absolute intake of calories and proteins. Um, in fact, if you take average intake of calorie and protein before COVID, the average Indian consumed less than the recommended dietary allowance. So we started with a situation of very high levels of malnutrition and food security. And there's no doubt that there's been a huge increase in the last uh, two months. So we, I mean, we don't have any uh, numbers to estimate the increase, but I can give you the kind of numbers that uh, people are talking about uh, globally. Um, for every one percentage decline in GDP, uh, they're talking about a, oh, sorry, I have that number. Uh, according to a study of wider, uh, there will be, if there's 20% contraction in world GDP, there'll be another 400 million poor people. So this is the kind of uh, ratio between decline in GDP and increase in poverty. So we don't have the numbers for India because we don't have know as yet how much is the decline in income. But I think it's visible to all of us that uh, because of the lockdown for almost two months now, majority of Indians have lost their livelihoods and their incomes have collapsed to zero. So given that the, uh, what we have in the packages announced so far by the central government uh, is really... Uh, minuscule or the pathetic is what I can say. Madhuri, you were talking about the malnourishment in India, particularly among the younger population, zero to five years, children and so on. Well, how do we compare in global terms? You said we have one of the worst records. In terms of the uh, absolute number of malnourished, uh, India has, it has the world's highest number of children, malnourished children. Uh, but some say that may not be the correct comparison because we are a population of you know, over 1.3, 1.4 billion. But even in terms of the proportion of children who are malnourished, India has uh, about uh, um, you know, numbers which are very similar to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the latest number we have is for 2015-16, uh, which suggests that 36%, so more than one third of children uh, below five are malnourished on the wait for age criterion. So uh, while we claim to be one of the growing economies, we certainly have a far better uh, per capita income than sub-Saharan Africa. Our figures being low also then shows the sharpness of the divide in terms of poverty in this country. Absolutely. So even though uh, there has been, you know, slow decline in the uh, incidence of poverty, 
uh, over the last sort of 10, 15 years, our absolute measure of poverty is so low that uh, it's not ensuring a nutritious diet even for those who are above, just above the poverty line. And I'd like to bring in one figure here that uh, in 2017-18, the consumer expenditure survey data was not released, but there was a leak which suggested that in absolute value, the average consumption had come down from 2011. So I think before the COVID crisis hit us, we were in a situation of worsening income and poverty, worsening unemployment. And this has come as a sort of double burden on that situation. So already growing inequality, now a huge hit on their income. This is the way. That's you right. see it. And the fact that there are at least 100 million migrant workers in the cities and towns, a lot of them going back. So you'll see a huge hit on their incomes and therefore on the poverty levels as well as nutritional levels. Absolutely. So one is that, you know, 90% uh, or so of our workforce is in the informal sector and a very large majority of them uh, are casual workers or workers in small self-employed businesses who have had zero income. Although the rural areas have not been as badly affected economically in the sense that agriculture has continued, agriculture, fisheries, dairying, all these have been called essential activities. But our studies show that for the poor households in rural areas, particularly for manual worker households, almost 40 to 50% of their annual income comes from the migrant worker's income. So the collapse of the migrant worker income is affecting him or her in the city, but is also having immediate repercussion on the family in the village. Uh, so we talk about rural India being somehow protected from the virus as it were, but it has not been protected from the economic collapse. So that is very much going to affect not only the urban areas, but also the rural areas, and particularly now the migrant population going back at least 40 million by reports are already either going back or on the way back. So this is going to make the things much worse. Coming back to what the government should or has not done. Let's look at this 20 lakh crore uh, so-called stimulus that's been talked about. Others have said it's really not a stimulus, but thinking, okay, there is this amount of money which the government is saying it's going to spend. Is any of it or any significant part of it going to the section which needs it most? Uh, you know, there's, there's, I'm, I'm uh, only read what others have estimated, but they're saying in real terms, if you take away all the loans and all the role of the RBI and the banks, probably the fiscal stimulus is at most 1%. 1% uh, of the GDP. Of GDP. Not 10% of the GDP. And, and not 10%. But let's focus on what's going for food security. Okay. And there are two components to that. One is the cash transfer or cash income, because as I said, you don't just eat plain rice or plain chapatis. You need some, you need fuel, you need uh, spices, you need to buy some things to go with it. So the collapse of the cash income among households has not been replaced. There's been a, you know, a pittance of 500 rupees for uh, those in Jandhan, Yojana and so on. So, um, the amount of income transfer that is required is at least 5,000 or 7,000 rupees per month for a rural or an urban poor household. In fact, Sri Lanka has given 5,000 Sri Lankan rupees uh, to about um, six, five and a half billion households already. So other countries are doing it, even other developing countries. If we don't want to compare ourselves with the UK or the US, or Europe, uh, there has to be a cash transfer for two to three months till the economic activity returns. The second is the food component. Now, India has a long and history and well-established public distribution system. And I think that, in a sense, 
we have an opportunity we have the network of ration shops more than you know something like 5 lakh ration shops in the country network of dealers network of storage points food corporation of india go down so we have this whole network ready which other countries may not have this is the time to really say we are going to make food distribution universal and we are going to give adequate quantity and quality of food so i think that's what needs to be done and has not been done so when you talk about quality of food not just quantity you're really talking about not just rice or wheat and not just for instance dals but also other supplementary foods or essential foods in that sense like for instance protein intake eggs other things is that what you are what you think we should add to uh, yeah kitchen? i'm referring to uh, the dals also uh because as i said the latest in uh, data we had showed that the average uh, indian was consuming less than 60 gram of protein which is the daily protein requirement so even if we take uh, half that protein requirement to be given you require both pulses and eggs and um, milk and other products so i think that what is easy to do to start with is to start distributing pulses oil salt sugar spices etc with the rations and to add maybe the easiest would be to add it through the school meals or through the school distribution system uh add fruit vegetables milk and eggs if we can give one cooked i mean hot nutritious meal to all the children as well as you know open it out from that school center to the elderly to pregnant women and others who are vulnerable if we can give one balanced and nutritious meal uh, i think that will make a big difference and this is the time to start uh, again we have a network of uh, we have a school meal program which is near universal it was closed down for the last two months and in many states as we know the quality of food given is uh, poor uh but i think that can be ramped up when you have a system already in place then using it becomes much easier scaling it up or using it yeah. much easier so and i think you know to say to start something new at this stage people will say we are in a crisis and you want something new but we have a ration network we have a school meal and icds network at every village level at every ward level so we can uh, improve the quality of food being given there i think relatively easily kerala has continued to supply meals to the school children and reaching their homes to give uh, the school children the meals which they were supposed to get in the schools so has any other government taken such measures as of now i don't think so because the argument that has been used by most governments is of uh distancing what they call social distancing but what i think we should call physical distancing um again i think that to uh, we are now two months down and the lockdown is being relaxed so when we are talking today i think people are queuing up for bus tickets people are queuing up for rations to have a queue to collect food in a in a school in a village school or in a ward school in a public school is something that can be done uh with uh, you know appropriate water for hand washing and so on uh so i think that this should be started in a uh, immediately by all state governments i want to add that you know the state governments uh kerala is doing a remarkable job but kerala as much as any other state government is hugely short of resources now now so the central government has to take the responsibility in terms of funding this better quality of food or that in terms really of funding my, that was really my yeah. next question that given the fact okay. that the states do not have the resources that this would really demand particularly if you want a school based so nutrition program it would really need transfer from the center exchequer which at the moment not only it's not forthcoming but even the what the states are supposed to get is not coming to them 
So we really have a double hit on the states. So what is the kind of transfer, scale of transfers we are talking about in this case, which the center should do to the states? Uh, so let, let me just go back a minute that even at the peak of our uh, distribution through the ration system, the uh, food subsidy of the government of India has never exceeded 1% of GDP. Now, we're all uh, talking about this package being 1%, but just think of it. We are talking about reaching uh, 800 to 900 million people. Uh, if we say that we're taking two thirds of our population as you know, severely food insecure, uh, to reach 900 million or a billion, uh, how is 1% of GDP adequate? So, I mean, is this what we allocate for 80% of our population, we give them only 1% of our GDP. So I would think that even if we can, uh, uh, and remember that when we are procuring fruit and vegetable, one of the worst hit uh, agricultures right now are the uh, horticulture and uh, fisheries and so on, whose which are perishable products who have not been able to store it where the system of minimum support price doesn't exist. So if we procure fruit, vegetable, milk, and so on, and distribute it uh, at a subsidized rate through schools, we're actually also supporting the economy and it's coming back. So the subsidy, I say, I have not done the calculation, but I think if we add another 1% of GDP, so if we say 2% of GDP for food security, I think that would be quite a substantive uh, sum of money to ensure this. And what it will do is really put cash in the hands of the people who are the growers. So in that, that sense, it will be a double benefit economically. Absolutely. So in fact, that is the other part of it. Even the, uh, the meat industry, uh, I know Kerala has even uh, given fish and meat as part of some of their school meals. So uh, th that's very desirable, but at least eggs, which is sort of easier to transport and so on. So I think that, you know, the meat industry is in a doldrum, um, poultry is in a very bad shape. So this could actually become part of the revival of these in industries. But as you know, the Hindutva lobby, particularly in this country, is also a part of the understanding, has a part an understanding that vegetarianism is Hinduism, while other, uh, if we're a non-vegetarian, it's somehow being anti-Hindu, if not anti-national. So we have that problem as well in the country. Which is, uh, um, I, I, I think that, uh, and there's also been a scare, and you know, because of this uh, zoonotic disease, people think there has been a you know scaremongering about consumption. But I think the protein deficiency in India is, of course, one part of it is because there is so little animal protein in the diets of uh, people, and that's because they can't afford it. That's true. They can only afford, you know, meat or fish or mutton or something once a month or once a year. So it's really, um, this is a time when we could, uh, we could see this as a way of actually improving, not just controlling the de you know, deterioration that is happening, but improving the nutrition of large masses. And one point I want to make here is that for children, uh, particularly young children, even two months of a poor diet is something that's going to have a long-term effect on their health on chronic diseases, on their cognitive development. So we really have to address this very quickly. You've we, written about six crisis. Months, sorry. Yeah. You've written about the crisis in UK during the war and the rationing they did, adding proteins to it. And actually their health figures improved during the war in spite of all the deprivations that supposedly they faced. That's right, life expectancy for males, that too, who were being killed in the war, and the mortality, uh, life expectancy increase and mortality decrease was most rapid in the 1940s, as in the, if you take the whole 1900 to 1950 period in UK and Wales. Uh, and this is because of equal distribution. 
a more equitable distribution yeah, equitable distribution and i think if we look at the quantity of food and vegetable uh, india is producing if we look at the stocks of food grain we have the quantity so, so we are not basically a we have the ability in terms of production it is just exactly. the distribution and the support the government needs to do which is lacking and the fact that even under the conditions of crisis we are not thinking in this direction at all and that's what is really what shall we say the crisis of our conscience in this particular case world over now there there are a lot of estimates coming out that poverty is going to increase food insecurity is going to increase all the global organizations have already uh, indicated that and i think if we don't do something i think it will be unconscionable that we are going to have a major increase a worsening of nutrition and food security in this country uh, after a slow but steady improvement so i think that um, not that we have much to talk about we were in a bad situation but uh, i think this is this is going to be a major as you said unconscionable uh, reversal thank you very much madhura for being with us we'll be in touch on this and other issues this is all the time we have for news click today do keep watching news click and visit our website Thank you.